Welcome to Breaking Par with Bernard Sheridan, the golf podcast that interviews the best and brightest minds in the golf industry. Now, here's your host, Bernard Sheridan. So, William, welcome to Breaking Par. Thanks for being with us today. Hey, absolutely. Great to be on the show. So, you're back in the UK right now. Yeah, back hanging out with the family, just taking a little break. This is usually sort of a quieter time of year for me just to be able to, you know, spend some time with the family, get some cooler weather and, uh, you know, look forward to what's coming in the next year. So normally when you're in the States, where where are you work out of? Uh, Up in Sacramento, Sacramento, California. Nice. So beautiful area there. It is. It is a really nice place. Yeah, so we were chatting uh, before we went on the air, and I'm down here in Naples, Florida, so it's 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 quite warm down here right now. And yeah, a little um, toasty. It would be kind of nice to get away a little bit and get someplace cooler, but um, you know, some like it hot. I'm one of those guys. So there you go, perfect. So uh, to start off with, um, when is the first time that you got involved with golf? First time I got involved with golf was playing actually just down the road from you on Sanibel Island when I was eight years old, um, seven or eight years old, and my dad bought me a set of clubs, and we went out and played at Sanibel, and that was when I first, my my parents were living out there for, uh, my dad was working for IBM and used to play maybe a couple times a year with him, so that was the first time I swung a club. Nice, and uh, and when was that aha moment when you said, you know what? I'd like to be involved in this a little bit more seriously and actually uh, try to take it on as a career. Yeah, probably around about, um, I picked up, like really picked it up at about age 13 is when I started to play consistently. And uh, within that first summer of playing, that's when I realized I wanted to play golf and wanted to come to America. I'd lived in Florida as a kid and I was now back in England and I knew that I'd like to go to America and play college golf and go and, you know, try it out as a career. So what, what, when you decided to do that, um, what was the progression of that? So in other words, did you say, hey, I want to try to be a tour professional? Or did you decide, I want to, I want to get into instruction? What, what was the time that you, know, you decided to really find your career path? Yeah, I mean, at 13, 14, I, you know, was like pretty new to golf. You know, I played a few times, but uh, played for about a year, got down to about, a, I think, about a 10 or 11 and then the following year got down to a three and then at 16 i went out to monterey in california and met with some of my parents friends and got to see a college out there monterey peninsula and then at 17 i moved over to california and played two years of college golf there and then moved back over to florida and played two years in west palm beach and then graduated and decided i want to turn professional so i went back and uh, caddied over at cypress point where i'd caddied in college spent three years working on my game and raising funds and then went out there and um, gave it a shot to play professionally. So, and, and how did that go? And, and where, where did you end up? I uh, played one event and then went on my honeymoon. And um, some people know, some people don't, but my wife and I got washed out to sea in our honeymoon on, in Thailand and uh, spent seven weeks in hospital in Thailand and came back and couldn't swing a golf club. And... Uh, Basically, my path was changed that someone offered, do you want to start teaching? And I said, no, not really. And my wife got laid off and I couldn't swing a golf club. And I looked at my bank account and I thought maybe teaching would be a good idea. So that was the start of my teaching. And I went back and played after that. But um, just was very difficult to uh, to sustain the amount of practice I had to do to keep up. And so over time, I changed my, my focus from playing to, to coaching. Well, we're glad that you survived. That's for sure. And yeah, and, me too. Uh, and I'm sure that the golf world is too, because you know it's funny how God puts us uh, in positions, and it totally changes our direction and our path Absolutely. in life. And um, sometimes, you know, it, when it's happening to us, um, we feel like it's the worst thing that could ever happen to us. Um, but sometimes it it opens new doors, like it did for you. And, uh, and and really um, so so now that that door has been open um, how, how do you feel about that I mean are you glad that I don't want to say you're glad that you got washed out to sea because nobody would ever be glad about that but but are you are you really uh, you know happy and fulfilled in what your position is in life right now yeah absolutely absolutely it was uh, 
you know, it was, it was tough when I, when I first got, got into coaching, I was just doing it to hold over the time until my injuries cleared up so I could go back and play. But I think the beauty of that was, is that I came to the golf course. Nobody knew my story. I didn't tell anybody my story, but I had a very different mindset in terms of, I saw so many people frustrated, you know, just miserable. And I'm out on the lesson tee and I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what I've just gone through because you don't need to know it, but I'm not going to allow you to speak to yourself that way. I'm not going to allow you to treat yourself that way. This is your hobby. This is what you say you love. And so, you know, I'd really put it to people. I'd say, look, how about you stop? How about you quit playing the game you're trying to play, so-called golf? And how about I teach you how to play a game called golf? And so knowing that I was going to go back and play professionally allowed me not to be like everybody else. Because if I knew it was going to be my career, I'd have probably gone one-on-one and stood on a driving range and, and built up a lesson book. But my idea was like, I don't, I don't really care what you think you should be working on. What you need to be working on is thinking the right way. You need to be learning how to score. You need to stop putting yourself down. You need to start practicing with more purpose. And so I just pulled people off the driving range and I said, look, you know, let's not do an hour lesson here. Let's hop in a cart and go and play. I can teach you how to get the ball in the hole. I know how to do that. I'm doing, I'm meant to be doing it for a living, but right now I've just got some injuries, so I can't. So let's go and do that. So that's really how it led into, I found my space because I wasn't trying to be like anybody else. And then when I went back to play, I, I just struggled, you know, I mean, I was shooting even par, but I was always in pain and, it just didn't feel right. Yet when I coached, I was having a ton of fun. People were dropping insane amounts of shots, having so much fun, saying how different it was. And so over time, it, it really sort of clicked, you know, that aha moment that happened. I remember Dana Rader was talking at uh, uh, NCPGA event, and she just said, you know, one day you might realize that playing isn't your career and maybe it should be po- coaching. And so at that moment, I realized, you know what, I've got a path that I can do some really really good stuff here and so I've loved it ever since and once I accepted that my path of playing for a living was gone and um, now I get to coach and play play the game and, and coach people so I love it. So is the bulk of what you do with your students out on the golf course and and really affecting in the in the mental side of it and and how to really plot their way around the golf course and better understand sure that how to how to get the ball in the hole? Yeah, I think um, I think there's three things that I focus on. There's th- I call them the three keys. I believe that most people are locked up. You know, they just don't have the ability to get out their own way. They do on the second ball. Once they've hit the ball out of bounds, they put they tee one up and rip it right down the middle and then go, why the hell couldn't I do that on the first ball? Well, on the first ball, you had expectations. On the first ball, you had the left brain going crazy and trying. And on the second ball, you just didn't care and your God-given talent came out. And so for me, it's... The first thing I want to do is is help them to understand the mental side is the key thing. But for me, I've got to teach them what I call the real game of golf, because if they don't know the real game of golf, then they're, they're trying to perfect a game that's imperfectible. And all I want them to do is play the game. And so the more that I can get them to understand, look, this is a game of misses. It's a game of mistakes. It's a game of errors. It's a game of, frustra- you know, of frustration if you see it in perfection. And so once they start to realize that, you know, the best players in the world from eight feet miss more often than they make it and you think when you miss a 15 footer it was a miss you know it's like your numbers are wrong your the real game of golf is keep the ball in play and chip and putt that's the real game of golf now if you can understand that now i can set you up mentally to play it because now you know that to shoot a 78 you don't have to do anything great you just have to avoid the three triples or four doubles or the quad and the you know that you have in a round so that's really what i try and work on is that you know first of all teach them the real game of golf then the golfing mindset and finally how to practice with a purpose and i find that rather than teaching them things i'm trying to get rid of stuff most people are so they've got so much stuff going on in their head and so many emotions running and they're trying to add more and i'm like look strip it all down and let's see what's left and it's the quickest way to improve is to get rid of stuff not to add stuff it's my experience for golfers who've played golf if you've never picked up a club before you can't do that because you don't know how to do anything yet so that's kind of my journey of how i coach my players you know it's funny that you said uh they have high expectations and and um i was doing a uh, supervised practice session the other day and and a husband and wife came in and um, they were working with another instructor on our team and I'm the guy who's in charge of supervised practice so so every every, everybody who has a student if they're in this supervised practice program they come they're allowed to come twice a week it runs four times a week and I'm there to oversee it 
and to make sure that they're working on the things that they need to be working on and that they're doing them correctly and things like that. And uh, the woman who was who was one of the first, uh, it's it's she only took one lesson so far, and she came to the supervised practice, and we were working on a few things, uh, mainly mainly weight transfer, getting her to turn through the shot a little bit better, and um, and she hit a few good shots, and I and I was very pleased with it. Then she hit a few bad shots, and she hit a couple more bad shots. Um, but they weren't terrible shots. They were just not perfect for her. And yeah. she was like, see, I can't do that. I can't do it. You know, and I said, I said, well, you're, I said, you're placing the level of what you believe you should achieve right now higher than what a tour pro believes they can achieve. I said, if you look at a tour pro and they play a round of golf and they shoot a 69 um, and it's a par 72 and, they, and you ask them, how many shots out there did you hit exactly the way you wanted to? They would say two or three. Um, I said, and the rest of them, they would, they would have a lower, you know, and feel like they didn't achieve what they were trying to achieve, but they did keep the ball in play. And um, I said, if you, if you look at it that way, I said, you're talking about someone who can go out and shoot a 62 and is a little upset because they shot a 69, but they're still happy because they're a few under and, and they're playing okay. Um, but they don't hit a perfect shot every time. I said, you have to lower your, the level of what you're trying to achieve here and just say that I made solid contact and I hit it close to where I want to. Then we'll yeah. worry about all the other stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the, the one thing that seems to happen though in golf though is that they aren't taught that stuff very often from, you know, you're helping with them that stuff. But I think the game of golf has become so swing orientated that if you have this amazing swing, then you'll always feel good. And if you always feel good, you'll always hit the ball good. But even the best players in the world will tell you that their swing changes four to five times in a round of golf. You know, they're, they're warming up and then they're warmed up. Then they have to wait for 25 minutes on a par three. Then, especially if you're playing cart golf, now you sit down at the turn for 15 minutes and wait for the 10th tee box. Then later on in the round, you're a little bit tired. And then, I mean, your body's changing minute by minute, let alone week by week and month by month and year by year. So this idea of building a swing that will be flawless is insane. You know, the... The only thing you can really do is keep the ball in play and have a short game. And the days that it's on, it's really enjoyable. And you embrace them and go, God, that was fun. I hit the ball beautifully. It was great. But the fact is, is that for myself, for most of the guys I know, that's maybe five to ten times a year. And they're playing 150 rounds a year. And the other times, like you said, they're shooting 69s and 71s or 85s or 92s, you know, and they're like, oh, I didn't really hit it very well. I so often hear from a lot of my students, they're like, Will, I just shot my lowest round ever and I did not hit the ball well. I just didn't I just didn't make any major mistakes. I just was patient and, and I made a couple four or five footers and my chipping was pretty good, but I hit the ball like nothing that good. And I'm like, doesn't it feel great to shoot your lower score and not feel like you did everything right, which probably won't happen again for at least another year compared to no, I just I could do that again tomorrow. And I think that's the thing is if you start to learn the real game of golf, which is like we said, keep the ball in play and have a short game, then you can at least I call get first gear. You can play any golf course, you can go to any course you want and go and at least play it. And you may not shoot your best score, but at least you won't make four doubles down the first four holes and be super upset. You just maneuver your way around and you build your way into the round. And I think that that's sort of a lost art. And I know that, you know, the, the Harmons of the world, some of the greatest coaches, you know, that's what they're very skilled at doing and, and educating their coaches. I think college coaches are very good at doing that because they're, they, they're not there to build swings. They're there to get kids to shoot low scores. So I think that the more, you know, every PGA pro and teaching pro and mini tour player and LPGA can share that with their amateur friends the more they start to realize that the tour players understand it and the amateurs don't you know and that's what we're there. that's the big disconnect and that's through instruction you know too much too much focus on the swing yeah i think that um that once you get the general uh basic fundamentals you know <clears throat> and and you get them where they're where you can consistently pretty much keep the ball in play you're not hitting it all over the yeah. place 
um, then then it's more about how you handle yourself out there. And if you do have a blow up, um, letting it go. Uh, so so what are some of the things that you do with your students to help them kind of let it go, to kind of reboot um, once they get to the next shot and not be so tied up into what, and the, into the mistake that they just did. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing that we do is uh, we put together a scorecard many years ago that breaks the game up into two parts. I think that blow up, I don't think, I just know. I've seen enough of it and so have you. Blow up holes happen when you give up at the second part of the game of golf. So the first part is what I call entering the scoring zone, getting off the tee box and getting somewhere where you might be able to get up and down and make a par or a bogey. And I think what happens is, is that people will hit one into the trees, hit one out, you know, they've lost a ball and they get to about 60 yards and then they just mentally shut off. And then they just wedge one into the rough. They double chip it. They knock it on the green three part and it's a nine. So what we do in our scorecard is we break the hole into two parts. We just say, look, all I want you to do is play into the 100-yard marker. Once you get to the 100-yard marker, that game is over. So if we're on a par four, instead of trying to get to a green, okay, because a tour player, the best tour players in the world hit 70% of greens in regulation, and we have to remember that they're hitting nine irons from 175 yards. So their nine irons stops dead, and your four hybrid from 160 comes in like a bullet. So they have a huge advantage, and they can only hit... 70 green 70 percent of greens so what we sort of say is look what if you could just get inside the scoring zone in regulation so just get to the 100 yard marker so it's almost like your green has become 100 yards now can you get down in three from there so when they do that they then put a check on the scorecard and that game is done it's over like i I don't care you hit a 290 yard drive or you hit one in the trees and pitched out to 100 it's over now can you get down in three or less and so it's a it's a physical action of sort of ending the hole or the game, we call it, and then moving on to down in the scoring zone. So that's one of the first things that we do is, you know, people say play one shot at a time, but that takes a long time to learn how to do that. So for amateurs, it's more about, look, play two games in one hole, entering the scoring zone and then down in the scoring zone, because the beauty of that is we don't do numbers. We do checks and X's. So if you got in there in two, you get a check. Well done. If you didn't, you just get an X. There's not an eight or a four or a one there. It's just a check and an X. So your mind gets out of numbers and thinking and how am I doing? Am I, oh, I'm four over, I suck. Or I'm four over, I'm playing amazing. You know, it only affects your emotions when you know your score. So once they're in the scoring zone, hey, if you chipped in in one, it's just a check. If you if you chipped on and two putted from a foot, it's still just a check. But if you got done in four, it's just an X. Even if you got done in a nine, it's just an X. So what it does, it just allows them to get, get away from you know this whole idea of numbers and just start to think about checks and x's and the fact is if you get two checks on a hole you can only make a bogey it's physically impossible to not make a bogey because you got into the scoring zone within two on a par four and then you took three to get down from 15 yards off the green that's a bogey so the worst you'll ever do is shoot a 90 and most people when they do it they'll have a couple one putts so they may have a two putt par so they shoot an 87 and these are players that are coming to me shooting 105 like thinking to break 100 i've got to get a better swing and in their very first lesson they'll shoot a 90 and they're like that doesn't make any sense and i'm like well it doesn't make any sense for what you were doing because what you were doing was trying to perfect your goal swing hit the ball better all i was doing was saying let's just say in business analogy you probably can't take someone from a one million dollar company a year to a two million dollar company a year in a month but by cutting expenses you could take their profit from negative fifty thousand dollars to a positive three hundred thousand dollars just by hey we've got to cut back here cut on the cut cut these expenses stop this way stop and that's possible so that's really what we're doing is really trying to get them to understand that huge improvement can be made and then once all that fat has been cut yes then you've got to get better skill sets you actually do have to wedge the ball closer and hit the ball further but most people are trying to generate more revenue in their company but they don't save and they're just throwing money out the back door every minute and they're wondering i'm a 10 million dollar company now and i still can't shoot you know i still can't break even well until you look at the second part of it which is in business the goal is to be profitable and in golf the goal is to score so low score wins in golf and biggest profit wins in business once you play that game it's not that hard to see what you should be working on but most people aren't doing that they're trying to make as much money as they possibly can in business and it sounds good i'm a hundred million dollar company but you're bankrupt 
and oh, I hit my driver 300 yards with a hard draw, and I have X, X flex shafts and all this. But you just shot an 86, and you just spent four thousand dollars on golf lessons and a new set of clubs and all this stuff. So you know, good for you. But I prefer to go out there and slap it round and and shoot a 79 and be really happy with myself with the limited skills that I have as a mid handicap. You know, it's it's some awesome stuff there. So so when when they get to the point um, where they need to practice a little bit more on the skills part of it, uh, do you have them practicing more? on uh inside of 100 yards and on the green um because that's really where they're going to convert that into a par or a bogey at worst yeah i mean the, the the beauty of it is is that um brad pluth a coach that i work with he always says people can't fight with their own numbers so the fact is at the end of nine holes let's say they go out there and how many times did you enter the scoring zone inside 100 yards eight of nine times okay so eight of nine okay so how many times you get down in three two of nine okay you tell me what you think you should work on i'm not going to tell you i want you to tell me no one's ever turned to me and said well you know what i need nine of nine in the scoring so they, they go yeah I, I i get it so really the, the the key is what we try and do as coaches remove ourselves from the situation of decision making and get them to make better decisions so the scorecard the purpose of practice card tells them what to work on and if they don't want to do it that's fine they don't want to change and that's not up to me you know what i mean some people just don't want to change and yeah, they, they say they do and you say okay well obviously if you want to change you would but you don't right now so have some more frustration a little bit more pain and then maybe come back another time but the fact is most people go, no, this is common sense. I mean, if I could go from two in nine to maybe five in nine, I'd save three shots. Yes, that's mathematically correct. You would. Now, if they came off and they're like, Will, I lost six golf balls. I entered the scoring zone two out of nine times. Well, I throw their driver in a lake and I tell them, right, I just saved you a bunch of time. Now go and do it. And you're only allowed to hit a hybrid. Whoa, I got eight of nine. Okay, so you don't need to fix your driver. Well, when am I going to fix my driver? When am I going to fix? Once you shoot an 85 or an 86 and you've got to that level where it's like you really need to be further down the fairway now, then I'll teach you how to hit a driver. But right now you're using equipment that is way out of your pay grade and it's hurting you. When it can be helpful to you, I'm, I'll teach you everything. You need to know how to hit a one, one iron off of hard pan downhill. I will teach you that shot when we get there, but I'm not sure when we're ever going to get there. But most people are, well, but, but you meant to hit driver. Well, seeing that Henrik Stenson probably only hit his driver 10 times last year, you know what I mean? It's, it's about you finding your identity on the golf course and caring about how much fun can I have and how low can I shoot? And the way to do that is think logically and rationally. And when you practice find your areas of weakness which will show up and then the biggest thing i would say Brendan, is when we're practicing is is that there are no drills very few drills most people are left brain drills technique 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 and then they go and play golf in the right brain this is the reactive side of the brain and they wonder why when i play golf do i not play very well but when i practice i do great well you're practicing for a sprint and you go and run a marathon I don't care how long you take, four years for the Olympics to practice running sprinting and you show up to the marathon, you're not going to do any good because it's a completely different form of running. And golf is one ball, a score, targets, trouble, people watching, slow pace of play, and standing on a driving range hitting 75, seven irons in a row is not golf. It's That's not golf. It's just you know, it's just it's just making a rehearsal swing and repeating that rehearsal swing. So we want the people out there playing nine holes putting, nine holes chipping, putting against each other, playing in teams, playing little fun games for a soda closest to the hole, everything to get them nervous so they can get comfortable with their nerves when they're practicing and competing against each other. So when they go and play, it's like, this is common sense. This is just fun. And that's very different than just, you know, beating golf balls or hitting a shag bag of 100 balls to a one one hole target and, and thinking you're getting better. You might be getting a better skill, but just because you have good skills doesn't mean you can apply it on the golf course. Well, and well you're getting we, better at, at doing what you do on the range. Absolutely. You're, you're getting absolutely. a better, you're, exactly. you're becoming a better range player is what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, practice. That's practice why so many people say, how come I permanent. can't translate my game from the range to the golf course? I play great on the range. Absolutely. But when I get yep. to the golf course, I throw everything gets messed up. Well, absolutely. that's that's why. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's just crazy how um, you know. I believe that golf is the only sport that the majority of the time when people practice it, they don't practice it 
on the field that they're going to play on. Yep. It's a complete. It, it's it would be like um, practicing soccer in your backyard into a goal without anybody else playing, or yep. practicing baseball um, in a batting cage. Yep. And and then that's the only way you practice is in a batting cage, and then then when it's time to play, then then you're you know you're going up there and trying to hit. So it's it's a completely different thing. I mean, I, I think that maybe with uh, with the baseball thing, you know that little light blinks, and then next thing you know the ball's by you. At least that's how it is with me. Yep. And um, but when they're when they're uh, seeing a pitcher, they're looking at where their hand is when they're releasing yeah. it. They're trying to who's on first it. base who's on first base trying to steal second what's the guy behind me doing what's the outfield set the whole right what kind of hit of do i have to get to here do i need Absolutely. to just get a single to uh, and hit it to right Absolutely. field to advance to advance yep. the guy on second to third or do i need to hit it to left to advance the guy from first to second um yep. do, do, is it are, are the chips are down do i need to to get that run home or we're going to lose I mean, there's yep. all different scenarios. Same as when you're out on the golf course. There's all different scenarios as to the shot that you have to hit. Every single shot is different. You never hit the same shot twice. So so the best way to practice that stuff is to get out there, put yourself into the situation, and see if you can get through it. Well, I think the best thing that you're doing as well, Brennan, is that you've got the team coaching experience. So many people are like, I don't want to go and practice. I'm going to stand a freaking range. And half the time, they go out there and practice, and they get worse. They're hitting balls, and at the beginning, it's good. But but about 50 balls into it, their body starts to get tired. They don't feel tired. They start to hit it poorly. They get quick. They hit more. And by the end of it, they're sweating, and they're like, why the hell did I even come out today? Whereas when you've got a team experience where there's a coach there who's supervising your practice, who's saying, look, today – your game plan is to get to 80 and the last round you had you shot an 86 and you had four three putts now you know that's one thing but the thing is is that you missed all those putts inside of four feet which tells me that you were actually chipping it to 50 feet so we don't need to work on budding right now we need because they'll say oh i had 38 putts but you had 38 putts because you were so far away from the whole chipping and pitching a coach can come in there set that up get the two of them challenging against each other competing you know tracking your stats that's the whole thing is is that practice on your own unless you're you know there are some of you out here who are going to say the same as me it's like practicing on your own i love you know what i mean i love to get out there when i was a junior and just practice but my mindset was i'm doing it to win the masters and i've got a whole three bunker shots before i leave so i didn't know what i was doing at that time but I think all of us know, like, can I hit this shot over here? I got to hit five in the, in a row with inside a foot. You know, you're always challenging yourself. And I was okay to do it on my own. It was just a very good space. But to me, I love seeing adults and my high school players and my juniors competing against each other. And, and to be honest, we're, we're swimming upstream because the game of golf has become so swing orientated and I'll hear it all the time. Will, I'm not swinging good. I need more private lessons. I need more swing stuff. I need more swing. And I'm like, Look, I'm telling. Why would I lie to you? I care about you so much. I want to get you better. I'm just. I'm. I would. I would not lie to you if I thought the full swing was the problem. I'm going to stand there and teach you full swing. But the fact is, is that how mentally strong are you, and how good is your short game, and how patient are you? Because, you know, I can go out there and I just play with my my dad and my brother the other day with a half set of clubs, old clubs of mine, and you know, just went out there and just. I just know when not to hit driver, and I know where to avoid trouble, and I know. You know, when I do get into trouble, I know how to get out and, and you just scrape around, you know, nice, even par, one under par, you know, and it's just it's just like that. And then I can be swinging the club absolutely beautifully, hitting it great, working on my game and be like, right, I really want to do well in this tournament. I want to make the cut and I want to succeed. And I shoot a 77 and you are like, I had my own set of clubs. I practiced, I worked on my game and I put tons of expectations on myself and I played terribly. And so even though I'm a pro and I've done it for years, the equation is if you add salt to a cake, it ends up being salty <laughs> and you don't want a salt cake, right? So right. the idea is you have to follow the recipe and the recipe is I know you're looking to get a college scholarship. I know you're looking to break 80. I know you want to win the club championship, but you play your best golf when you take away expectations, stick to the routine, you know, don't get upset, don't play aggressively, be patient. But how often do you play golf like that? You don't. We go out with high expectations and hope. And hope hope leads to a very bad place because it's misery in the game of golf. And well, so I think that's really the key. William, don't you think that with the way that today's mindset is too, um, with technology and 
and how people are used to almost instant gratification that it's difficult for them on the golf course to be as patient um, because patience is not something that a lot of people have as much of as they did before all this stuff came along. I would agree. I would agree. But I think that if you if you look back at how how mad, you know, whether it be Seve or it doesn't matter, you know, 50 years ago, I mean, guys used to get super upset on the golf course. I think human nature is to have high expectations. And the beauty of golf compared to business is if I need my business to work better or if I'm a school student and I need to get better, just work your butt off. Just stay up late and study and study and study and read and, and get around up and, you, and you'll get better. But in golf, you stay up late and work too hard, you wake up and play worse the next day. So yeah. it's this ability to let go. And I think that I, I agree with you that I think technology nowadays, a lot of people are like, well, I, I've got my flight scope and my track man, I've got my numbers. St still doesn't help because that's not to do with scoring. That's just to do with getting better ball trajectory, better ball spin, whatever it may be. They're all useful. But it's a little bit like the gadget saying this will fix everything. The fact is it will fix something. And all the tools that are put out there, Trackman's amazing, Sam Putt Lab, Aim, Aimpoint, all that stuff's amazing. If you use it as the right tool, you know, a chainsaw is great. But if you use it to go and try and cut toast, it's not exactly the best tool. No, you know what I'm saying? True. So, it's the, you know, it's that idea of if I'm going to get better at playing the game of golf, the best thing I can suggest you do is, number one, get a coach. And the difference between a coach and an instructor, in my opinion, is a coach is going to give you what you need. An instructor is going to give you what you want. An instructor is going to go, oh, yeah, you want to hit your driver further? Let's work on your driver. A coach is going to go, you want to break 100 and you want to work on driver? Hell no. Give me that driver. It's in my car until you break 90 and then we'll get, take it. And a coach takes that control, which is what you're doing, you know, in supervised practice and expectations in practice train and practice hard but when you go and play have no expectations because you should feel like hey i've given it everything i've got so why wouldn't i play well today so i'm just going to go out and trust it and i think that's the big thing that you've got to really look for is a coach that can help you on that journey and then get around other like-minded players who your coach will be putting that team together so you can compete against each other and then from there do what you do in everything in life for success have have goals track your improvement and then just be willing to look at data over time, not over one round. Oh, I shot an 86. Okay, it's an 86. Get over it. Oh, and then everything's gone to pieces. But if you look at that over three years, an 86, two years ago, you'd have been delighted. But our expectation, well, I, I, I'm shooting in the 70s now. I should never shoot in the 80s again. Well, ask Johnny Miller or uh, Ian Baker Finch or any of those guys. Golf is elusive. It, you know, you start doing the wrong things. It's going to go whether you've won a major or you haven't won a major. It's and just I think like that's, life. I mean, it's just like life. I mean, things can, you know, you can be go. You're proof of that. I'm proof of that. I mean, you can be go. Everything's going fine. And next thing you know, you get washed out to sea. Absolutely. So, so now, so what do we do to, to regroup? And what do we yep. do now? Not do we cry about what, what happened to us and be miserable for the rest of our lives because we had this unfortunate thing happen to us. No, we, yeah. we forge ahead and do the best that we can today at this moment. And if we yep. do that, then the next moment might be a little bit better. It might I'm not so. too, but yeah. that's okay. And if we accept that, then, you know, and that's what I love so much about golf is it, it's so much parallels life. And if we can kind of live them both the same way, our yep. golf game and our lives, um, we'll be a lot happier in, in those small victories not always saying, you know, I need the perfect person to be happy or I need the perfect job to be happy or I need it's it's get the little bit of happiness in what you're doing right now. And 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 on the golf course it might be I'll look back and I'll instead of thinking of a round that maybe I shot an eighty four and I'll look back and I'll go, Yeah, but there was those two shots that were just so sweet that I just hit just the way I wanted and and I did really well with that. And if I look at the numbers, it's really not that bad. I can fix a few things here and there. Tomorrow's another day. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's I mean that's why I love working with my high school players. You know, they 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 practice, they work hard at their game and you know 
getting them to start to understand the level of maturity you have to play to play this game is crazy far beyond my years still you know is is that you just have to be so patient when you just want to you just want to lash out you have to be unbelievably patient you know and you have to you have to take the good with the bad and, and you just learn that that journey of improvement and so that's really like i said i mean why you know acceptance is the key in golf you know if you can just accept the result you know, if the result was, hey, I made a mistake because I got into the golf ball and I and I, I wasn't sure if it was an eight or a nine, but then I saw the group behind me, so I went ahead and hit anyway. If you can accept that you hit this ball OB after that, then that's fine. Go ahead and pull the trigger. But my suggestion is most people don't accept it. They make excuses. Oh, well, you know, I, I wasn't sure. I didn't sleep well last night. My clubs weren't clean. My grip slipped. I haven't been working on my swing. A thousand and one excuses. But if you can really say, you no, know, the truth is, I was super nervous because the last time I hit this eight ton, I chunked it into the water and I swung anyway. Well, then you can't be upset because you knew you never gave yourself a chance to hit the golf shot. But if you get over the ball and say, no, I believed it was an eight iron. I set up, I saw a perfect shot and I swung it with confidence and I shanked it, went straight out of bounds. Well, guess what? There's nothing you can do about that. Put another one down and go again. And I think that's where people struggle with golf is that they feel like if I gave it everything I did and I didn't hit a good shot, what does that make me? It's just that like makes you a human being. Just hit the next one. And that's what we really try and get into is accept the result. But if you lie to yourself, if you tell yourself a story of, well, 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 you know, it, 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 the greens were, the bunker was, the group was, the wind was. That's the challenge. Accept the challenge. I mean, you know, if 89 is the best you can shoot today, 89 is the best you can shoot today. If 62 is the best you can shoot today and you shot 67, then you've got to look at it truthfully. And I think that a lot of people, and I know as I grew up, I wasn't willing to look at it. I always had a, a reason or an excuse. So I'm working on my swing. I'm, 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 doing, I'm making a swing fix. What does that mean? I mean, I've gone out and not played golf for three months, you know, had an injury and gone straight back out and shot a 67 in a tournament. Hadn't touched a club, hadn't thought about golf, and go and play great. And I've practiced 10 hours a day for six months. And as an, as an amateur about to turn professional, I shot a 90 in a tournament. I mean, I came off the golf course. I didn't know what I, I did know, not know what had happened out there. So this idea that I haven't practiced or I haven't given it, they're just all stories. And if they work for you and you want to stay miserable and play bad golf, then keep your stories. But if you want to make change, just start to change the stories. Start to say, what if? You know, what if I did commit fully to this shot? What if what if I did believe that I'm good enough? You know, what if I got rid of that story that I haven't practiced enough? And it's amazing how good you can get. And so that's really so much of our, my time is just listening to stories that people are telling themselves and having a team around me listen to my stories so they can call me on it. You know what I mean? And say, yeah. well, that sounds like a story. Because you know, anyone, if I sound like I'm coming across, like I figured this out, that's as far from the truth as possible. I, I just think I know it more because I can empathize with people more because I know that on a daily basis, I tell myself what, what a great friend of mine used to call rational lies. Okay. People say, I'm rationalizing. No, he would say to me, he was from, he was from Israel. He says, Will, you know what rationalize means? It means telling yourself rational lies. And I was like, That's exactly what it is. I'm lying to myself to try and f uh, bring down my nerves and my anxiety before I play. Oh, I haven't practiced and this is a tough course. And what why you know why do that why not just go out there with the mindset of like i'm just going to give it everything i've got in every shot and if i shoot a thousand i shoot a thousand if i shoot 18 under i shoot 18 under but the fact is i'm going to come off of here knowing i gave it my best and that's it and that's that's taken me years of you know frustration and trying to to really come to the ability to be able to help people in that process now william is there a book that you could recommend uh for players to read that you think would help them with some of this? Um, I mean, the, I mean, the best psychology book I think out there, Golf, Golf's Not a Game of Perfect by Bob Bratella. I mean, he kind of states it in the title, right? Golf's Not a Game of Perfect. And seeing he's taught probably the best coaches, the best students that, that have been around, I would say that's a good one to go to. Um, I think... Um, Let's think. Golf's Not a Game of Perfect is a really good one. I mean, all the Bob Rotella stuff is really good. I do love that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of good – I mean, it doesn't have to be with golf either, I suppose, is, is no. one of the things I would be saying is, is that, you know, sometimes with golf we we get a little, a little bit too too involved um, with thinking – thinking too much and trying too hard but i would i would say bob you know if you haven't read that and if you have read it go and read it again because it's such a good book i would say that would be that would be my top top pick excellent excellent so if anyone wants to get in touch with you 
and uh, and and work with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, I mean, the best thing they can do is just check out our website, which is thescoringmethod.com. And that's the system that we created, the scoring method. And the whole idea behind that is, you know, entering the scoring zone, down in the scoring zone. And this is a a step-by-step method of how to do it. And so we have, you know, we've got uh, online training courses that people can take. We've got coaches all over the world that use our system now. And the fun part for me is I train coaches how to build out their their coaching programs. And I get to step back. My name's not involved with it. And they get to go and experience the joy that I've had over the last 12 years by seeing people really start to play the game of golf and that goes way beyond just their score their life changing the the experiences they're having so you know you can check out you know the scoring method or you can go to willrobbinsgolf.com um and you know anyone that's got any questions fire them to me through through email um will at wrgolf.com or will at willrobbinsgolf.com and um yeah send them send them my way Great. Well, William, it was awesome having you here, and it was a great show. Really enjoyed all this information for our listeners. And uh, like we always say at the end of our parting here, until we meet again, do your best to keep it in the short grass. Absolutely. Thanks. Have a great one. Great. Wonderful. You've been listening to Breaking Par with your host, Bernard Sheridan. Follow us on Twitter at Breaking Par and on Facebook at Par Breakers Golf Academy. Until next week, try to keep it on the short grass. Do you want to improve your game? Of course you do. Then you should consider an online lesson with Bernard Sheridan. It's simple. Just email us at parbreakers at gmail.com. Then send us a video of your swing from face on and down the line. Bernard will do a swing analysis of your swing then send you drills to work on to improve, and all for only $49.99, along with a live video chat so you understand exactly what you need to improve on. No matter where you live, you can now improve your impact to improve your game, all at a reasonable price. Contact Bernard at parbreakers at gmail.com today.